So our first speaker from the Green Party is Gina Dowding, who is the MEP for North East of England. North West, I'm sorry, North West of England. We just lost out by that much. <laughs> and she will be telling us about how climate change is worsening conflict. Welcome, Gina. Sorry about the mistake. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that loud enough? Um, just firstly to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you. Um, for giving up your daily lives, for taking the time out and for putting your bodies on the line. I want to raise the issue now about not just we've heard how weapons and war are causing climate breakdown, but I want to explore as well how climate breakdown itself is causing further conflict, because we find ourselves in a self-fulfilling spiral. As was said, I'm Gina Dowding, I'm the North West MEP, newly elected for the Greens. But I've just only recently moved up that spectrum of activism because I've been heavily involved in fighting the shale gas industry at Preston New Road. And it's wonderful to see people here today, from Lancashire to London. And just to give you a little bit of hope, there's people who have been putting their bodies on the line in Lancashire day after day after day, and the police have been there in their lines just like they are here today. But let's just remember that right now, today, at Preston New Road, fracking has been suspended. But these things are so intricately linked. The fossil fuel industry, climate change, war, arms, and human misery. War is desperately costly and immoral in human and social tar terms, regardless of the climate impact. War is not just a waste of resources that could be used to tackle climate change, but it in itself is a significant cause now of environmental harm. There are few activities on the planet that are as environmentally catastrophic as waging war. Greenhouse, greenhouse gas accounting, in terms of accounting for the emissions, usually focuses on civilian use of oil and gas and fuel. It so rarely takes into account the use by the military. But actually, it's the military and our own UK armed forces among them that are, have considerably higher carbon footprints. Just as an example, in 2017 in the US, the military there bought per day over 270,000 barrels of oil. 270,000 barrels of oil per day. And that created 25,000 kilotons of carbon dioxide by burning those fuels every day. So the environmental cost of war, as we know itself, is too high. And it has been estimated that the Iraq war between 2003 and 2007 accounted for over 140 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, more than 60% of all the countries in the world. But let's just talk a little bit about climate breakdown and how climate breakdown in itself is causing resource shortages and conflict something that our media are always so reluctant to mention. So just as an example, in Syria, there's plenty of evidence that the 2007 to 2010 drought in Syria was a major conflict co contributor to the conflict. It was the worst drought on record Coupled with poor water management, it caused widespread multi-year crop failures, economic deterioration, and consequently a mass migration of farming communities to the urban centres. And when rural farmers and herders are driven to the urban centres, there wasn't enough food, there wasn't enough water, there wasn't enough housing for everyone. So effectively, that primed the populace for concentrated, large-scale political unrest. And although climate change itself can't explain al-Assad's brutal crackdown on his own peoples, 
it prompted a confrontation that might not have otherwise occurred. It's the figures that make me have to look at the paper. So we know that climate is inducing water shortages, a cause of major conflict. Climate is, is causing desertification and water scarcity, helping fuel social desperation, which creates the conditions for armed insurgencies. And there's competition over scarce natural resources at the boundaries, the borders between countries, thus also causing international conflict. And by causing people to move within their home countries or to new ones, extreme weather and rising sea levels are the triggers for creating climate refugees. There's no single agency, no single country on the planet yet that actually recognizes climate refugees. But they are often the most wonderful, the most vulnerable, the poorest, and those who have absolutely no protection in international law at the moment. So we find ourselves in this self-fulfilling spiral. Conflict causing climate change, climate change causing further conflict. What do we need to do? We need to invest in our societies, not in weapons. Reduce conflict risk and prepare for a changing climate. Things like adaptation strategies such as crop insurance, post-harvest storage, training, and other measures can increase food security and diversify economic opportunities, thus ultimately reducing potential climate conflict links. We need peacekeeping, conflict mediation, and post-conflict aid operations to incorporate, to incorporate climate into their risk reduction strategies. They need to look at ways that the climatic hazards hazards are exacerbating violent conflict in the future. We need greater social justice in trade and tax. And finally, we need to recognize that the solutions to climate change require strong communities and flourishing democracies. And there's no irony that we ourselves in the UK find ourselves almost being labelled by Europe as a failed state. And there's protests elsewhere today on the street trying to protect our democracy. And I think that everybody has a role to play. But you here today are being the bravest and the most resilient. And we want to say thank you for putting your bodies on the line. And when we go home today, we will remember you for being here and you'll be on the right side of history and just keep up what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our fifth, our fifth speaker today uh, is future climate scientist Chris Wells. Chris is the third year PhD student